Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand-Up. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. And I mean, we are having way too much fun around here. Uh, Michael is out running around on assignment, and I've got some stories for you here. Oil is not out of the woods yet. This one is by Irina Slav over at oilprice.com. We've got relying on electricity interconnectors adds to market risk. Energy security is something we all could use. Can the North Sea become a clean energy super basin? I don't know about that. Renewable energy rise creates challenges for traditional power utilities. You can't make this one up. And just an update on the, so Union Salvers prep next salvagers, next stage race to avert a Red Sea environmental disaster. First part of an environmental disaster is to the Houthis. Quit blowing up ships. That would be one way around it. Oil is not out of the woods yet. With This article is by from Irina Slom, and this was posted out on oilprice.com. Crude oil prices revived this week with WTI recovering to $70 per barrel, this week being fueled by the Federal Reserve, which just released today that they were going to do a half a point, and it's actually going to have more expected. The number of investment banks and forecasters have revised down oil price for forecast for the remainder of 2024. Morgan Stanley, for instance, revised down its Brent crude forecast for the fourth quarter to $75 a barrel. Uh, At the time I'm recording this, it's about $70 a barrel from $80 a barrel. Swedish financial major SEB concurs with its chief commodities analyst, also putting Brent's average around $75 a barrel. BCA research is is very pessimistic. This is, quote, the cyclical global growth outlook ultimately suggests that the worst has not yet passed for the oil market. The path of least resistance is prices on the downside for a six to nine month horizon. I believe it's Abram said the investors who are long oil should cut back their exposure in anticipation of lower prices ahead. I'm really not sure on that. But we'll see how that turns around. A rate cut would probably buoy oil prices for some time. It would signal the U.S. economy is truly on the mend. We'll have to see how this is. Here is fund manager Gary Ross told Bloomberg, the weakness is at the back of the market. The industry is bearish in 2025. The financials drive the flat price and are hugely short by historical standards. They're clearly pricing a very poor economic outlook. I think Irina did an outstanding job on this article. And let's go to the next one here. Energy security for countries is critical. Relying on electricity, electricity interconnectors adds to a market risk. You've got to control your energy future and control your energy grid. In its 2023 future scenarios, National Grid, ESONG, said to manage I, I, the Funkel uh, periods, dispatchal thermal power plants, gas and or hydrogen, depending on the scenario, are likely to be required. A combination of DES, compressed air energy storage, and liquid energy storage, LAES, pumped hydro storage, PHS and interconnectors will all be required to manage the network during these par- periods. One thing out of that paragraph that is not being told is the cost. The raw cost of that paragraph is incredible. Interconnects are incredibly expensive. The storage mechanisms that they were talking about are incredibly expensive, and it would be a lot cheaper just to use natural gas and a lot less impact on the environment. Offgem has identified electricity exports as a source of consumer disbenefit. One might assume that the countries from which countries prop up our grid with exports might realize this is bad for their domestic consumers and have a rethink. 
once you put in a grid interconnect between countries and then you expect that you're going to rely on another country's fiscal responsibility, that's, a, that's not something I would want to do as a leader of a country. Interconnects are bad for energy security and long-term plans, in my opinion. Let's go to the next story. Can the North Sea become a clean energy super basin? The North Sea has potential of becoming a, quote, clean energy super basin in integrating oil and gas, offshore wind, carbon storage to drive the UK's energy transition, according to the NSTA chief executive, Stuart Payne. Love his name. Spelled the same way as mine. Speaking at the Offshore Energy's UK annual conference in Aberdeen, Mr. Payne emphasized that the oil and gas industry has the resources and infrastructure to transition to a cleaner infrastructure while continuing to support the UK's energy needs. I couldn't agree with this statement more. The UK is not doing their oil and gas companies any favors by, by doing the windfall profits tax and not reinvesting in their oil companies, they're basically, for a lack of a better word, and excuse me, bastardizing the oil companies in the UK, and they will not be around for them to kick around. They may be leaving. Just You can bookmark this podcast. We're going to need the best team possible to be successful, Mr. Payne said, calling for a greater inclusion, industrial, traditional, and... He is missing the point in that they've got to look at not necessarily saying, hey, wait a minute, our oil and gas companies can do this. They have the expertise. They can build equipment in hostile environments, do a great job. They have great people. And I think it's a right idea, but they have the wrong plan in order to make this thing even work. So the answer is, I think they're dreaming. Renewable energy creates challenges for traditional power companies. Renewable energy generation in Europe has surged over 280% since 2000 and now accounts for more than 50% of the continent's total power generation. Solar power has been particularly strong growth in recent years due to significant cost declines. However, the rise of renewables has also led to the challenges for the power industry, such as the underlying profitability declines and increasingly competitive energy landscape emerges. Government support for renewable energy is also changing. Renewable projects are underwritten through government support. People are tired of paying these exorbitant energy prices. Renewable energy, when it's not implemented incorrectly, equals deindustrialization. Deindustrialization, Germany is a perfect example. New Jersey, New York, and California are following along. You have those kind of green energy policies following along with left-leaning Biden-Harris policies, and you get deindustrialization just like in Germany. Excellent article from Rydstad. Let's go to the so, so Union Salver, uh, Salvagers prep next stage in a race to avert the Red Sea environmental disaster. This poor ship was struck several weeks ago by the Houthis, and I, I am surprised it is still afloat. It says a lot for the work being done so that they can try to get the oil off of the tanker. But what is not being talked about, and I want to bring to light, is the amount of extra harm to the environment that the Houthis are actually causing by sending all of the LNG tankers around the world. The records that are being broken by the shipping over through the Arctic regions, doing more damage there, and the ships and containers that are being lost off of the Cape going all the way around this entire mess. I believe that if we had a very good president that actually was paying attention, the Houthis would actually stop 
blowing up tankers and we would actually have less costs, less supply chain problems, and actually have some stop to the uh, hoodies blowing things up over there. So anyway, with that, please like, subscribe, share, read this to your pets several times. And then also, if you are looking to buy and sell LNG, jet fuel, oil, crude, let us know. Go to energynewsbeat.co forward slash trading desk. Reach out to me at any time and we want to get you in touch with the right people. Thank you and have an absolutely wonderful day. Talk to you all soon.